Um, Keith um, is recently retired uh, from the government, uh, working on his agribusiness, agriculture. Hold on a second. Let me get this right here. In the, it sounded like a government um, uh, organization, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Is that a, uh, Keith, is that a, uh, was that a government office? Yes, it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he was also president of the International Mycological Association, uh, executive editor of the Journal of, uh, Journal of the Mycological Society of America, Mycologia. And um, he uh, recently retired um, uh, from the government. He is still an adjunct professor at Carleton University. And he's written a book which was reviewed recently in um, uh, the Washington Post, so you may have seen it. Uh, another in the series of books telling us about how absolutely important fungi are to all uh, life on this planet. Um, and his particular focus, uh, because he's a, um, he specializes in microscopic uh, fungi, uh, is to talk about the fungi we don't see in the forest and how it is so pervasive. Um, so uh, uh, what I want to do is give him an opportunity to talk a little bit about his, his book and his perspective on the importance of fungi, but also um, asked him specifically because he does work on uh, DNA sequencing uh, to talk about his perspective on how we deal with the name problems for um, amateurs. Uh, I'm starting to get to the point where I'm reluctant in a um, in an eye naturalist observation to commit myself to what species something is anymore. Um, and uh, at some point we may all revert back to common names again or refer to everything as a species complex. And I'm really interested to hear what Keith has to say about that. So go ahead, you should be able to share your screen, Keith. Okay, we'll give it a shot. Okay, so do you see the first slide? We do, and we see and you. Do we see me too? I don't hear you anymore, John. It looks good. Okay, so you, you can hear me fine. So this this came together quite quickly after the, the book that John mentioned was uh, reviewed in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago, and he he contacted me and gave me a really easy uh, topic, <laughs> which is to try to speak about fungal names and the relationship with species concepts, and uh, the present movement of um, trying to cope with DNA data, all as it pertains to the citizen scientist. Um, all of you who have been trying to cope with this know that absorbing the scientific names of fungi can be like trying to follow the characters in a Russian novel. Everyone seems to have multiple names, formal names, family names, nicknames, and they're really only clear to those who are steeped in the culture. And the rest of us tend to mentally just kind of bleep over them and end up confused about who loves who and who kills who. But scientific names are a necessary evil that you can't really avoid when you're talking about fungi because quite often they're all that we have. And all of us professional or citizen scientists go through the same process of lodging these weird scientific names into our working vocabulary. I have a vivid memory of watching television during the spring break of my third year of university. And my mother was at the other end of the couch smoking and doing a crossword puzzle. And I was just kind of drifting off. And there was this swirl of letters in front of my eyes and this kind of gibberish of sounds in my brain of all the names that had been thrown at me in the past year in, in university. But suddenly a word crystallized out like a ribbon in my imagination. And that word was aspergillus. 
And ever since then, I had no fear of trying to learn Latin names. So what I want to try to convince you today is to give yourself a break when it comes to learning about names and about taxonomy. It's usual in life that people use words in different ways. Some people use words much more precisely than other people. So you, we're used to the idea of, of language mutating and evolving. And this is an obvious thing when you think about medicine. If it weren't for a particular variant of a particular strain of a particular virus species, I might actually be there with you in Washington putting you to sleep in, in person instead of doing it over the internet. The three years ago, none of us knew anything about any of this. Whoops, wrong way. There we go, okay. So John mentioned my book, it just came out in May. And I, I just wanna say a few things about it uh, before moving on to the subject at hand. So th this book is a journey through the hidden kingdom of fungi as John mentioned. And, but it's focused on the relationship that fungi have with humans and other living beings and the environment. And I really wanted to broaden the perspective that the general public had of, of fungi and give an overview of the huge number of effects they have on our lives. I didn't want to tell them the same stories that they'd already heard. So there's not much in here about mycorrhizal communication or psychoactive mushrooms. And the focus is more on microscopic fungi and how they use us and how um, we use them. And it's written for anybody to read. So at least that's the intention. But to me, biology, so behavior, relationships, utility, is more interesting than names. But here I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about names. As for the epigraph, I just wanted to, to point out that I was looking for an epigraph that could have been written by a fungus. So I like that one. There's not much about names in the book. Um, at the back, there's um, there's an appendix, like this is part of the appendix that, that lists the names and the classification of the fungi that I mentioned. And I, in the introduction I wrote, I truly would like to protect you from the nerdish topic of fungal classification. Even though I spent most of my career working in fungal taxonomy, it still often feels like a violent spectator sport rather than a science. Most other biologists find ways to discreetly leave the room when the taxonomists get started. So as you all know, and as I try to reflect in my title, taxonomy should be fun. So let's play a game and we won't, we won't try to run a poll having, having seen how successful John was with the poll, but we, we could just start with, with this. So, you won't, since nobody's seeing you, you can keep track of it yourself and, and we'll just see um, how, how this goes. So to quote one of the most famous 20th century mycologists who worked on ascomycetes, his name was J.A. Von Arx, and he told me one night over supper, taxonomy is just a big game. So what we're gonna do is go through a bunch of things and see whether you think that there are a genus or a species or, or something else. So ducks, are ducks a genus or are ducks a species? Neither, ducks are a subfamily. So how about swans? Well, swans, that's a genus, that's the genus Cygnus. Flamingos. Yes, flamingos are a genus, and there's six or seven species of flamingos, but for taxonomists, anyway, don't ask about the fossil record in this genus. Very controversial. How about owls? Are owls a genus or a species? No, owls are a family. Dogs, genus, whoops, <laughs> dogs, <laughs> genus or species. No, a species, and one of the best arguments against the morphological species concept you can find. And you can, each of you can try to align your present state of mind with one of those dogs. Hopefully not too many of you are feeling like the beagle now. 
What about kangaroos, genus or family? Well, they're sort of a genus. Kangaroos are big wallabies and classified in the same genus as some wallabies, Macropoda, but not all wallabies. The kangaroo on the left is clearly annoyed by the taxonomic process, the, some kind of primate on the right. And in case you didn't rise, realize there's also something called the wallaroo. How about a giraffe? Are they a genus or a species? Well, they're both, but it's one species genus with nine subspecies. Subspecies, what does that even mean? There may be a few botanists among you, so how about this then? Is this a family or a genus? It's hard to believe, but this is all one species, Brassica oleariaceae. Uh, yeah, and these veggies are cons all considered varieties, whatever that means. So yes, cabbages are kind of the dogs of the vegetable world, love some and fear others. Finally, bears. For bears, the folk taxonomy correlates really well with the real taxonomy. Most We're still on the kangaroo picture. Oops. I keep, your slides aren't advancing. Yep, there's the giraffe. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. I'm running two things at once. That's the thing. Okay, <laughs> giraffes, all one species. Giraffes, yep. One species of a thing. There's the brassicas, all one species, and we're on to bears. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. For bears, um, the folk taxonomy correlates well with the real taxonomy. Most of the things that we think of of bears as black, black bear, grizzly bear, polar bear, uh, really are species and they all belong in one genus, Ursus. And most of us know that some things we call bears are not bears, like koalas, so they truly belong somewhere else. So folk taxonomy, which based on the similarities that we humans perceive in our ordinary day-to-day -day lives without microscopes, it's a different process than phylogenetic taxonomy, which is based on evolutionary lineages so common descent, family trees. There's a lot of subjectivity inherent in our ideas of what a genus is and what a species is. And they are heavily contaminated by anthropomorphism and our own bias that our species is the most typical or representative one, or even that species necessarily even exists at all in other domains of life. Which is another way of saying that despite our own folk classification as Homo taxonoma, taxonomicus, the classifying ape, most of us are actually not very good at this. So let's step sideways to medicine. We're used to the idea that a drug might have different names. And this is an interesting example of an artificial taxonomy, by the way. The manufacturer in this case is like the genus, Bayer, for example. And the brand name is like the species epithet. In a natural classification, we, these would all be part of the same species defined by the chemical name. One of these examples is misclassified, by the way. Sorry about that, that's Advil. Advil needs to be transferred to a different genus. Automobiles are also an interesting um, analogy to think of when you're thinking about fung fungal taxonomy. My first car was a Toyota Corolla on the bottom and I knew at the time that that it actually was the same vehicle as the Chevy Nova. One was built in Japan and one was built in the United States and some parts came from those countries and some parts were traded back and forth between those two countries. So these were the same species. But cars are also interesting from another perspective and, that, and that's the whole idea of a, a form taxonomy which was so common in in mycology uh, up until 10 or 12 years ago. So th this is, uh, we have in our imagination, when you think of cars, you think of station wagons, sedans, pickup trucks, Humvees. These are all kind of form taxa. They are, we recognize them by their, their function and, and what they do, but it's not a natural classification. So Toyota Corolla, that's genus species. And, Hatchback isn't part of the isn't part of the the formal classification of that species. These cars are all 
made by Renault actually. So this is a monophyletic group when it comes to automobiles. So the question of names and the challenges faced by scientists and citizen scientists, I really like to state my opinion that there is a continuum between so-called amateur and professional mycologists. The citizen scientists have always contributed a lot to fungal taxonomy in the past, primarily by providing specimens to professionals. And often they don't feel that they've received the respect or the credit that they deserve. But I started my career around so-called amateurs in the Dutch Mycological Society when I did my PhD. And they all knew a lot more than I did. And among the members of that club were acknowledged national experts on particular genera, um, that they spent their days as lawyers or train conductors. Right now, citizen scientists who want to contribute data to the broader scientific endeavor have more opportunities than ever before. And I'm every bit the citizen scientist in other ways. When I retired, I took up moths. I thought of them as being the, the fungi of the insect world. And I've worked entirely on iNaturalist to learn about this. And all my interactions with prof professional lepidopterists on this site have been very pleasant. But I've also learned to recognize the characteristic hierarchical behavior that taxonomists often display to each other. So let's start looking at, at the name process a bit more formally. And, and this, this is very basic, but the rules are that the scientific names are in Latin. There's two parts, it's called a binomial and each binomial must be unique. There is a nomenclatural code, which is now called the International Code on Algae, Fungi, and Plants. There's another code for bacteria, there's another code for viruses, and there's another code for animals. And the significance of that will become uh, obvious. There, there was also in the past an American code, botanical code, and a European botanical code. And that uh, it was about 100 years ago, that situation, and that caused a lot of problems with names being used differently in Europe and America um, when there were these two codes. All names have to have a type specimen, so this is a representative specimen that, that defines the species. So if there's questions about what characters the species ha might have that weren't in the original description, future researchers can go back and look at that type specimen. So in his book, A Short History of Nearly Everything, Bill Bryson tells the story of an American explorer named Edward Drinker Cope, and I'm not making up his name. He noticed that there was no type specimen for Homo sapiens. And he decided that he wanted to leave his personal skeleton to the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia to serve as the exemplar of our species. Unfortunately, after he died, his bones were prepared for display and the conservators noticed the telltale signs of advanced syphilis in Cope's remains. The taxonomic powers that be decided that it would not do to have the type specimen of modern humans exhibit venereal disease and Cope's wish went unfulfilled and there's still no type specimen for humans. So with all the foregoing in mind, let's take a dip into fungal naming and classification and see what we find. So the two-part Latin scientific name for a particular species is known as a binomial. The first word in the binomial indicates the genus. The second word, which we call the epithet, labels the species within the genus. Not many people study Latin or Greek anymore. So we don't have a lot of that recognition of the classical parts of the, all of these names. I actually tried to take Latin in grade 10, which was about 50 years ago when only three other students signed up for the course. So it wasn't enough and the school dropped the course completely from its curriculum and never offered it again. So for anybody educated past the 1960s, good luck. You need to make 
a hobby out of Latin. Though it may not seem like it, most binomials do tell you something about a fungus and catching the innuendos makes them easier to remember. So take Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that saccharo means sugar, you know, that's uh, sucrose, saccharose, saccharose, these are all sugars, and myces means fungus. So if, and if you've ever ordered beer in a Spanish speaking country, like the United States, you'll know that cerveza is the Spanish word for beer. So the Latin name describes the brewer's yeast perfectly as the sugar fungus from beer. After all, one reason we love this fungus is that it takes the sugar and barley or grapes and converts it into ethanol. So there's all kinds of ways that people name, come up with the species epithet. You'll find species named after color, places, people, people's friends, people's enemies, politicians, pol political events. One of the interesting things I wanted to point out to this group of people, I can't find any species named after Paul Stamets or Gary Linkoff. So I think that you guys, when you're out there trying to find new species with your DNA team, should keep that in mind. They certainly deserve to have some species named after them. So here's a some names that all reflect that this, a certain mushroom, these are all mushrooms, I think, um, has a particular shade of blue. Um, it kind of reminds me of George Carlin's riff, but why is there no blue food, man? Lots of blue mushrooms. So just, just like uh, prospective parents might spend months choosing, name for their, choosing a name for their new baby, taxonomists often spend their coffee breaks batting ideas around to find the right name for a species. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, but it's a part it's a part of things that tends to get lost so i'm just gonna i think you all know about sponge formia square pants di that dennis de jardin named after uh, spongebob square pants maybe the other ones are less familiar to you this there's tyrannosaurus pinicola what's funny about that one is tyrannosaurus so you know about tyrannosaurus rex that's the terrible lizard s-a-u-r-u-s this is a terrible spot on, on pine trees. And uh, people isolate fungi from anything. So there's a fungus isolated off a cell phone by Renokita telephony. The longest Latin name is, I'm certainly not going to try to say that. And it, if you look at that, it, it's, you know, Cilio Coco Gocensis. And in the middle, there's Rob William something. This is a, named after a place in Wales. And the irony is that the, even the Welsh don't spell the, the full word. They, they have an abbreviation for this town that is what they use. As long as fungal name is uh, Cryptodibiosphereites princetonensis. So again, named after um, a place or an institution. So of the species that I've named myself, one of my favorites is Dialonectria eulifolia, but and eulifolia has only been used once as a species epithet, and it's the name of a pub in Oslo, Norway, where I had a fight <laughs> about this particular species with a, a taxonomist colleague who shall remain unnamed, and and uh, so this was my revenge on him was to uh, to name the uh, species after that pub. This is um, a species that I collected in, uh, in, in New Zealand. And I was collecting with a colleague of mine who works on really microscopic fungi. So when you go into the field with her, she sits down in one spot for about four hours and doesn't move. She's picking up every little piece of thing, a piece, piece of wood and leaves and needles and whatnot. And th this bird is the, uh, the South Island Robin, it's called. It's a very curious bird. And so it flitted around her and watched her for three hours while she was looking at different fungi. So we decided to name the species after 
the bird. And here's a species of penicillium that we named. And I don't know how many dog lovers there are in the group there. I assume everybody's a dog lover, but um, we named it Penicillium momoi and they're, they're momoi after this um, series of, it started on Instagram, I think. This guy from my hometown of Sudbury actually went around the world with his border collie and photographed the border collie in places. And the idea was like, like finding Waddle, you would try to find Momo. And, and he's in the picture there, just to the left of that central rotunda. Um, and we called this fungus Momo like because we isolated something like seven or 8,000 strains of penicillium and there was one of this, this uh, species. So we figured that it was like finding Momo to find this species. And then finally, uh, Valsonectria simpsonii, and that, that was named for H.J. Simpson in honor of his contributions to the safety of nuclear power. And I'm amazed that one got by the editor. So we're dealing now, um, as taxonomy changes, we, as technology that we apply to taxonomy changes, you always, they say standing on the shoulders of giants, maybe that's not really what it, what it is, but it's like a pyramid and, and there's all this information that de develops through the centuries and that kind of accumulates around species. So it started with this man, Elias Fries in, um, uh, he was 1830, 1820, six ish was when he published his things and, and you may have heard of Frisian taxonomy. So when I was a student in the 1970s, we were still learning Frisian taxonomy when it came to macrofungi. And we use this book and I don't know if you can see it because I can't see my own face, but that, so this is, this was the link off of, of my time, Mushrooms of North America by Orson K. Miller. It was a beautiful book, had, um, color photographs in it, which was very unusual at the time, was affordable. And this book is 50 years old almost, and, and the binding is still in perfect shape. So, but he, he had a pretty Frisian view of taxonomy. So most, most of the mushroom names used in this book, which is where I learned mushrooms, uh, are different than the names that were used in the first hour of this um, meeting for the same mushrooms. And then of course we went into the microscopic age and some of you in, in the mushroom clubs are, are, do have microscopes and are learning to use them and some are very adept with them. The molecular age started about the time I, um, shortly after I finished grad school. So I didn't learn that stuff in university. I had to learn it as a, a person in, in his late 20s, early 30s, whose brain was already starting to atrophy. But, um, and then now we're in the kind of genomic stage. So you, you can see that, that when you're working as a citizen scientist, you're, you're working at those first three levels, maybe the first, sometimes only the first level, the macromorphology level, and that's all okay. So when it comes to species concepts, we're not going to talk about all, all of this. There's, there's really not time in it, and it's, it gets quite complicated. But um, just, just to reiterate, you had, you had this up on your quiz earlier. In this book, he called it Polyparous Sulfurious, so not Letiparous Sulfurious. So I've managed to learn that much modern uh, macrofungal ta taxonomy. I now call it Letiparous. But... Um, so there's, I, I think most of you are familiar with the, the idea of synonymies. These are two names that represent the same species. Lumping and splitting, I think you pretty much are aware that, that in the past anyway, people used to accuse each other of being splitters if they divided something up into too many species and lumpers if they lumped too much variation into one. Cryptic species is a big, uh, thing now with molecular uh, taxonomy, DNA-based taxonomy, but that term is a little bit ambiguous or it's used inconsistently, I would say. Crypt cryptic just means hidden. So it, 
it can variably mean um, we'll, we'll keep talking about chanterelle. So Ch Ch Cantharella siberius with was recognized as a morpho species for a long time, but species within it that are difficult to tell about tell apart morphologically. So those would be considered cryptic species. But all of these species that people are discovering in soil um, that we know nothing about other than their DNA sequences, these are all also called cryptic species. And the idea of geo, geo, that should be geographically defined species, not undefined species, um, has already come up also in the discussion of chanterelles uh, with, the, with the thought that Cantharellus siberius might be a European species and the North American species might be something else. And this is very common all through fungal taxonomy, not, not just macrofungi, that people have assumed that the European and the North American versions that, of, of fungi that look the same are actually the same species. Sometimes they are, sometimes they are not. And then there's other tricky things that, that come into the whole idea here. Um, of, of uh, why species names change and, and why sometimes it's necessary to split a, what seems to be a recognizable species into cryptic species because there may be some value in doing that for somebody. So mostly you'll be aware of the morphological species concept. I don't think I need to explain that to you. Uh, biological species, that's humans are biological or biological species. Dogs are a biological species because all of that morphological variation that you see in both these species, we can all still um, mate with each other. So, so we're considered the, the same species. We don't, you know, all, all humanity and all dogs, two separate species. But so that, that idea started being applied to fungi probably about the 1950s, 1960s. And uh, for a while, that was the dominant species concept in fungi. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a moment. What we are dealing with now, and what you're thinking of with DNA-based uh, species, it's what we call phylogenetic species. And those are intended to be um, groups of organisms that are, have a common descent and form a, a cohesive gene pool of a kind. Um, that's, that's a bit vague, but mostly it's got out through DNA sequencing. And certainly over the past, I would say 20 years, there's been really an arms race in, in uh, the DNA sequencing. So we started off with just sequencing one gene and then it was three and then it was five and seven. And now we're seeing papers where they sequence 250, 300, 350 genes that they put into their phylogenetic analysis. And then of course there's uh, whole genomes as well. I'm gonna talk I, a little bit about chem chemotypes, which is using the, the, the metabolites that are made by the chemicals that are made by um, fungi as part of their classification. And, and that earlier when we were looking at the lichens that was mentioned, there were some lichen metabolites there. So this, this is a calm, they use metabolites in lichen taxonomy and in other groups of fungi they do as well. And then the whole idea of, of whether a, a pathogen or a parasite that can infect more than one host species, whether they might be automatically considered separate species. So we'll, we'll look at that a little bit. So honey mushrooms. When I went, went into university, when I was learning mushrooms, Armillaria melia was all one species and Dr. Miller um, wrote, wrote and said, it's an extremely morphological, morphologically variable species. And he also called it Armillaria lamelia, which is kind of funny. Why, why did he use a different generic name there? I'd forgotten, I, I knew at the time, but fortunately it's now come back to being Armillaria amelia, which is how it's always been known. And this, I think a lot of you will know about the, the humongous fungus and, and uh, 
these are various species of honey honey mushrooms that um, that do that. I'm going to try to move. That, at least for me, is better. Um, interesting thing about this fungus was my, my master's supervisor, R.J. Bandoni, um, thought it was poisonous, and and he kind of counseled his grad students not to eat this fungus, even though every book said it was edible and choice. And I had been eating it before I went to study with him. And then he explained to me when this paper came out by Jim Anderson and Bob Ulrich about biological species in Armillaria melia that they, I think they found 12 um, isolated, genetically isolated species in North America. And uh, he explained to me that it you know, wasn't just one species and he thought one of one or two of them might be poisonous. I've never seen anything about that in the literature, but uh, some of you may know that, that uh, forceful supervisors can have an effect on you for a long time. And then when it comes to phylogenetic species, after the, um, after the uh, biological species were delimited on a worldwide basis, um, we're seeing that what was once called one morphological species, uh, Armillary amelia, um, is, it now has all these names. I wanted to mention the honey mushroom thing. It, melia means honey. So it, the, the little scales on the, on the cap look to whoever described the species, like the crystals that form in honey. Doesn't taste like honey, I wish it did, but. So the penicillin fungus is a really interesting um, synonymy going for it. So it, when, when Fleming isolated this fungus in uh, 1928 in London, he, he identified it himself as penicillium rubrum, which means the red penicillium. And then the mycologist downstairs, I think, I uh, can't remember his name, now he identified it as penicillium notatum. And it, you'll often see the name penicillium notatum applied to this fungus um, even in modern literature. But it was synonymized with penicillium chrysogenum. Uh, chryso is gold and genum means uh, to admit sort of, so, or to give birth to, and you see the uh, yellowish liquid that comes out of these cultures. So it's good, good description for it. And then when the, so that was on a morphological basis. And then when the DNA sequencing came along, they divided the species up into four clades and uh, called, called this fungus either the Fleming clade or clade four. And it was about to be described as a new species called Penicillium flemingi. Uh, when someone else found there was an older name. So the oldest, known name to go for this species is Penicillium rubens now, not named after the painter, it just means uh, reddish again. Um, so you can still, Penicillium fleming I was never formally described, even though it, the paper that was going to describe it, they pulled the description out at the last moment. So it's still in the keywords, but it, that's the only place that it appears in the manuscript. It's the oldest name wins. Domesticated species um, do, do play a big role in food, especially. So Aspergillus oryzae, where's my, oh, I'm not gonna bother with. Um, Aspergillus oryzae is a, a mold that was domesticated from a toxic, the most toxic mold we know, which is Aspergillus flavus. It makes the toxin called alpha toxin. And alpha toxin is one of the leading causes of liver cancer in the world. And one of the great mysteries is how the, the um, Asian, they were microbiologists a thousand years ago, but how those artisans managed to select strains that didn't produce toxins. Um, it's, quite, it's quite a mystery. But at any rate, they did this more than once. There's several different times that, that this species has been domesticated out of the other species. Uh, Penicillium camembertii is the is the um, is the fungus that's used in camembert and brie cheeses. So it's a white penicillium. 
And it seems to be a domesticated form of penicillium communi, which is a really common uh, contaminant in refrigerators. So often if you have moldy yogurt, for example, if there's been a poke, hole poked in the lid um, and a spore has gone through and you've got a nice little island of green spores floating on it, that's probably penicillium communi. So it's, uh, again, it, it, this pair of species both seem to have an affinity for lipids and, and uh, dairy products. And Rhizopis oligosporus is the fungus that's uh, used to make tempeh, and it's probably a domesticated form of another species of Rhizopis, Rhizopis stolonifer, stolonifer, which is the kind of grayish thing that crawls out of your compost uh, buckets on the kitchen counter. So most of the names that, that I've been talking about now, I, I would say are of casual interest. The, at least the, the identification of this precise species is maybe not critical, <laughs> but, but some species names, it's, it's very important to get them right. So here's one Pneumocystis gerevechii, and this is the cause of um, PCP pneumonia in persons with AIDS. It was known as Pneumocystis carinii for about the first 25 years of the AIDS pandemic, but then some medical microbiologists showed that Pneumocystis carinii, based on the type specimen, so remember the type specimen, causes pneumonia in dogs, so it's not a, um, a pet pathogen of people. So the scientific name was changed to Pneumocystis gerevechii, which would have been named after a Slavic person named Jurevich. And, uh, but they didn't rename the, the disease. It stayed being caused, called PCP. So once it became realized that this, once we realized this thing was a, fi a fungus based on its DNA phylogeny, it had been described as a protist, or, and, and so it, it was a, it was governed by a different code of nomenclature than the, than the one that governs fungi. So this caused some rather serious complications as they tried to, to correct the name of, uh, of this very important fungus. These are intracellular parasites, so they don't make any hyphae. Um, there's no way you would think they were fungi, but there's a lot of these intracellular parasites in animals, including insects called microsporidia. And uh, if it's true that, that they are all species specific, that they only infect one host, and that most animals and insects have them, then that means that, that fungi will be the, the largest eukaryotic kingdom. So quarantine species, there's a lot of talk in the press, in the fungi, in the news about invasive species. So you, you would have heard about the white nose disease of bats, um, the, the frog chytrid. Uh, these are invasive species. So this is a serious thing that on an international uh, basis, countries try to guard their bar borders from these fungi coming in. There's a, a related concept is non-tariff trade barriers. So that's not, they're not invasive species, but they're, they're fungi you don't want to become invasive or you don't want them to get into your food chain. And non-tariff trade barriers tend to get very gray. And uh, because there's a temptation to use them as a bargaining chip when you're trying to, to trade, say wheat between um, two countries, if you can find a, a nuisance pest in there, you can demand that the price be lower, or you can tell them people that you're going to impound the boat for, for three weeks in the, um, in the harbor while you do your own studies, that kind of thing. United States and Canada plan, tend not to play that game. Uh, too much. You've got the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service 
there in DC and in Canada, we have the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. They work together closely. And when I worked for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, we worked together closely with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Just as a, an example of this situation, some of you will have heard of Panama disease of bananas. So this, this is, um, th this is a, a deadly disease of, of bananas, especially in uh, Asia. It's also in South America though. And um, there's a real, a real fear that the banana, that, as we know it, may go extinct. And this has uh, been caused by a fungus that was called Fusarium oxysperum, Formus bcialis cubens, and it's um, so. What's that? Formus bcialis. It, it it just means something that looks like Fusarium oxysperum. That's causing causes a fatal disease to bananas, and and uh, it's it's not a formal taxonomic category, but it's what's in the legislation. It's what's in the treaties. So if you change the name of something that's in legislation or in a treaty, it can cause serious issues. But at any rate, somebody did it. So they, they described a new species for that form of specialis and they called it Fusarium odoratissimum, odoratissimum, because of the smell. So that's, that's, a, that's a name change that would get people talking in Washington. And it goes into a much darker kind of space as well, and that's bioterrorism. And, um, the Australia group is an informal uh, group of, of mostly Western countries that um, agreed to share information on um, the presence of potential organisms that could be used for bioterrorism. So you can see here in this case, they, um, the names become an issue. So the, the idea here is that some bad people could take the, any of the fungi on this list and basically inoculate a competing country um, and cause an epidemic that would either lead to starvation or panic or, or, or whatever. So there, there's these fungi. I'm just going to talk a bit about one of them because it's... Um, so the generic name's controversial, but I, I, I don't want to talk about that. I just wanted, there were two species, uh, Pericularia arisi and Magnaporth grisia. And the question was whether they were the same. And, and the Magnaporth grows on rice. It causes blast disease, which is the big rice disease in the world. So that's an important name to have right. And so there was a paper in 1990 um, out of the USDA in, in Beltsville that said that these two species were identical. And then there was a paper 12 years later using a multi-gene phylogeny that suggests that these two species were actually separate and one should be called Arisi and one should be called Grisia. And so this picture of, of this is crabgrass in my side yard and those grayish spots on, on the leaf are this fungus um, a pericularia grisia, which through the microscope looks like this. I, I had to show one microphotograph uh, being a hyphomycete taxonomist. But um, I was, uh, when, when these two species were considered synonyms, I, I was afraid that, that I would be accused of harboring a, a potential bioterrorism organism in my side yard and probably in all of your side yards too. But it, it not to be too flip about it, it's um, getting the taxonomy right in these cases is important and getting the naming right is important. So how can citizen scientists contribute to all of this? Obviously providing data is the big one. And uh, the, the photographs that, that you showed today and the, the photographs that you're putting on um, Mushroom Observer and iNaturalist are data, and they're pretty excellent data for the most part. Um, back back in these days, you know, we were we were all taking black and white photographs. We couldn't afford to take color photographs. Even the books didn't have them. Now everything is in color. It's um, it's beautiful. Uh, 
I expect that a number of you are probably preserving specimens and I would encourage you to try to preserve specimens, especially of rare species. And one of the things that um, I naturalist, the mushroom observer and this website here, Mycoportal, are allowing us to do is determine which species really are rare and which species really are common and where do they actually occur. Before it was down to how, how much taxonomists collected and, and whether they ever got off the interstate into the depths of the forest to look, look uh, for a broad diversity of fungi. Now we have this army of, of amateurs uh, and, and citizen scientists out um, put, putting dots on maps. So Michael Portal, if you don't know, is the um, it's a unified database of all of the fungal herbaria in the United States and most of the ones in Canada. So it's very easy to use and very powerful. If you go in, say you think you found some interesting rare fungus, you go type that name into this site and it will tell you how many collections there are of that that are preserved. And you may find that there's hundreds or you may find that there's only the type. And that that's when it becomes very useful um, for you to preserve specimens. And then of course, um, a lot of citizen scientists through the years have collaborated with uh, specialists and, and that I think is happening more and more. Um, in, in my work, when, when I had to culture fungi, that was, it was invaluable to, to, to be able to ask somebody this fungus should be where you live, could you send it to me? And, and so if you know from uh, the mapping sites that, um, that it should be there, then, then uh, it's a good way to go about getting things. So back to chanterelles. It's ironic that there's been so much about chanterelles in the meeting today, and that's, I'm going to close with this. But um, so but the gold chanterelle is morphological species, right? And it's been divided up um, based on, on DNA phylogenies. And, and uh, so this particular list is the list that I had in my book. And, and uh, according to Scott, redhead Cantharella siberius does occur in Eastern North America. I, I can't participate in the argument, but I can share the observation, I guess, that he, that he feels that way. And I noticed that uh, Cantharellus flavus, which was mentioned earlier by John, I think uh, doesn't, uh, isn't on my list, but never mind. Siberius in Latin means food. So I, I went on iNaturalist yesterday and actually tried typing in Cantharellus siberius and there was only one dot on the map. So there, wh whoever is curating chanterelles and iNaturalist um, is very fastidious about preventing people from using the name Siberius. And, and I think he got me once. Um, but this is, so this is for Cantharellus and you see in your area there, all, all of these fuchsia dots that um, citizen scientists have contributed to a, a distribution map of chanterelles in your area. So now I'm making things up. Let's just imagine that, that uh, 20 people decided that they were gonna save specimens either in their garage or, or contribute them to a herbarium. And of those, some, some people did DNA barcodes um, to, to con confirm their identification. So that's the blue dots. And then maybe the golden dots in the, the lower, lower cluster there were the ones that had genomes done. But without the citizen scientists, that map would look like that. And I think I prefer when it looks like that. And it's kind of a heat map that you develop and you can, the community can develop. And this is the pyramid I was talking about. <laughs> this is the, the, uh, the pyramid I was talking about, where you've got a large amount of morphological data, and then you've got a smaller amount of specimen data and a smaller amount of molecular data and a smaller number of genomes, but it all adds up and it all contributes to the same picture. So 
So last thoughts. I think implicit in a lot of what I've been saying is that the idea of species may not be as fundamental to biology as we were taught. And there's something, at least as we use it, that varies from taxon to taxon and situation to situation. And, and I showed you this book a few times. How would you feel if you went to your doctor and his diagnostic manual was 40 years old? I don't think you'd be very impressed and would, maybe wouldn't trust it very much. Um, so as time marches on, you know that, that taxonomy is going to change, names are going to change, but the fungus is going to stay the same. All of these databases and websites that we have, such as Mushroom Observer and iNaturalist and, and um, Ask of France, and there's a, a very good one in Quebec and Canada, north of you, um, Champignon de Quebec or something. I'm not exactly sure what it's called, but, but all of these are, are data aggregators and it's people who work with these mushrooms and have knowledge of them in the field, they contribute a huge amount to what's known about the distribution of, of these fungi. And this kind of information can be useful uh, for preventing the misapplication of, of taxonomic identifications so of pretending that a fungus doesn't occur in this country. So therefore, um, we're going to impose an on-tariff trade barrier, that kind of thing. So that's what I, I wanted to tell you. I hope it wasn't too tedious. Um, just to close with, with a picture of my own lab from about 2017 or so, all the people that I worked with, my students and postdocs who uh, were all very dear to me. And uh, even though I'm retired now, I still enjoy seeing this picture. Great, thank you, Keith. Um, I have a few questions to, we're right at nine. So um, good job on the timing, but I'm gonna try to get through a couple questions here that came through. Um, Ooh, in my chat button here. Um, yeah, so question is, if you have a view on whether research grade observations are relatively reliable or would they have to be redone once preserved specimens are sequenced and determined that there are genetic differences? Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I, I have the same question myself, and I, and I know the, the different sites have different quality control philosophies. Um, in iNaturalist, research grade just means two people. Um, I know for myself, when I'm identifying moths, or, or mushrooms for that matter, because I'm no expert, that I, I look at the other person and say, do I think this person knows more than I do? I hope they do. And, and so that, but that's a, a quality control I can apply to something that I don't, I know about. But if it's something I don't know about, I don't know. It's I, what I think it does is it it gives an arrow. It tells somebody, points somebody. If if you're interested in this, either ask this person to go find it for you in this place, or um, go there yourself and look for it in that place. If you need more information. What, uh, in your view, is the contribution of DNA sequencing done by amateurs at, at the club level like we're doing? I don't know. I, that, that's because I don't know. It, it doesn't mean that I don't think it's useful. I, I'm just astonished that, uh, like, I know the lab we had. So I'm just astonished that people can do this in their in their houses and in their garages and things like that. But I would say that that um, as long as the, the quality control of the sequences, which is outside of what really what you, what you do at home, like the place that you send the DNA to, as long as the quality control is there and they, the sequence that you get back is real, um, then I think that's valuable. We, we can't expect anybody to just generate perfect data. Nobody does. So there, there's going to be an error rate, and I think we all can accept that. 
Um, so a couple questions around um, kind of getting down to species level. And um, so, for example, if a, a cryptic species, as you referred to earlier, means either two specimens that are known to be different species, however determined, but we can't tell by looking at morphology, or a species not yet known or described and therefore not named. Yeah, that's more or less what, yeah. I, I, well, I use Ralph as an, as an or, um, and, and honey mushrooms would be the same story. When, when I was a student, they were considered one species and the species that other people saw inside them with mating populations and so on would have seemed cryptic, hidden to, to those of us who, who had the Miller concept of, of Armillaria melia. But as people have looked at specimens knowing that they're different, they may find characters that tell these two apart or these seven apart or whatever, and, um, and they're no longer cryptic because they can be distinguished by any method well, including morphology. So um, a follow-up question from that was, once we get to an agreed upon species, is it possible that various specimens of that species have different metabolites, so one might be poison and the other not and yet the same species? Hmm. I know, I, I can answer that from the Aspergillus because that one I know, Aspergillus flavus. It's a very common mold. 60% of the strains make aflatoxin and 40% don't. Um, when it comes to things like Amanita, I certainly wouldn't want to take the chance. And I don't know if anybody's done, done the work to see how consistent the, the toxin profiles are in, in different populations of those mushrooms. My impression was that they were pretty constant, but... Um. And if a species is domesticated, is it considered a new species or is it a strain of the old species? Well, that's an interesting one. <laughs> I didn't really mention, I, I was going to go into Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but, but knowing this was a mushroom group, I didn't think that would fly. But, but so I don't remember exactly the details, but th so there's Saccharomyces cerevisiae I use for bread, for beer, wine, sake, uh, various, various, um, alcoholic beverages around the world that are have different starting materials and some of them are hybrids between two species and there's one of them um, I think it's one of the beer yeast that is a hybrid between two species where they know one what one parent is and they don't know what the other parent is so it's somewhere out in the world there is this other Saccharomyces that we know only as a hybrid as part of a hybrid so it, but a hybrid is not it challenges the um, biological species concept because two different species that two different phylogenetic species are able to somehow mate, but out in the world maybe they don't they don't get the chance to do that very often. So we, could, you know, they are reproductively isolated, but then when they get put together in the lab, maybe they can form hybrids. It's sort of like um, donkeys and horses, and maybe. Mm -hmm. If, if they don't meet each other, they're different species, but. Cool. Well, um, you probably haven't had a second to look at the chat, but there, there's a lot of kudos. People really enjoyed your presentation and, um, you know, looking forward to reading your book. Well, thanks. Thanks to all for having me. It was, uh, I, it, it was fun. And I really just wish that I could have been in Washington <laughs> with with you guys, I'm sure you'd all wish that you were together as well. So, it's uh, these these Zoom presentations. It, you never there's no audience feedback. You know you don't know who's sleeping and who's left and who's left. <laughs> For better or worse, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Keith. I will just second everyone's comments that this was um, far exceeded my expectations for a presentation on scientific nomenclature. <laughs> How interesting that could be. It really was fun. Um, and thanks to April and Mitch and John and everyone else who contributed um, 
Great meeting everybody. And uh, don't forget to sign up for Sequinota and to contact me. If you have made it to the end of this meeting, you might be a candidate for someone who should be on our board. <laughs> you definitely are. <laughs>